Okay, so now, okay, so our next next speaker um, is Andrew Chin, who uh, well started like a usual BSM student, except uh, except very early in the uh, second year. So BSM started in '85. And, and two years later, we got a computer due to PowerPoint. Uh, uh, he he uh, got his uh, uh, bachelor's degree at uh, UT Austin in '87. He became a Rhodes Scholar. He got his PhD in Oxford in '91. And then he began the usual academic career. He was teaching here, he was teaching there. And then, bomb. He got a degree in law in '98. And he's now a professor of law at the University of uh, North Carolina, Chattanooga, where I had oh, I had the good luck of, of uh, I, I I was visiting Chapel Hill sometime in November for a uh, meeting, and somehow I figured out that he was there. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, it's, it's, I was searching for something else among my gigabytes of email files of old, and it's just cropped up. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, it, 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 incredible luck, and then I contacted him, and then we had a, a, an absolutely magical uh, dinner together, uh, catching up on four decades, and, uh, and now maybe we hear something like that. <laughs> so, let's see. Yes, let's get out of that. Well, thank you all for the special opportunity to tell my story and to share some s scenes from my journey from mathematics into the legal academy and from a career of speaking mathematics to the law. And I want to dedicate this talk to the two close friends I lost much too early on this journey. Navid Saheb Kashaf was the first and the last American I, I saw during the Budapest spring semester of 1987. And he was the, my best friend in the program. He returned that summer to graduate with uh, math and physics degrees from Harvard, uh, but was killed only a few weeks later in a car accident. Um, Nadine Kowalski died of leukemia during her postdoc at the Institute of Advanced Study uh, after earning her PhD at Chicago. And it's fitting that I honor her memory 10 years after my Budapest classmate Bob Beals did. Um, he was uh, Lotzi's student at Chicago. And uh, he acknowledged her contributions in the American Mathematical Monthly with regret that he could not share his solution to a group theory problem with her. I knew Nadine uh, first as the only other ninth grader to participate in the final year of George Bergenie's problem competition in the Mathematics Student Journal, in which George tirelessly provided meticulous problem-solving critiques and fatherly guidance sometimes in our monthly correspondence. Just to comment, I think this is this this is this is what became the USA Math Talent Search, which is still going. Right, and I would soon meet George in person as one of the students he took from Texas on the, the team to Armel at the University of Maryland, on a week-long bus trip on Trailways, Trailways bus, and Nadine as a fellow participant in the Mathematical Olympiad program at Annapolis in 1982. And I roomed with Brian Hunt and met some other people you may recognize. And I returned to Annapolis two years later as the seventh place USIMO winner, but I didn't make it on the IMO team. Uh, Nadine attended the uh, 1983 MOP at uh, West Point, but she didn't return to Annapolis the following year. So we didn't cross paths again at MOP. But we did maintain a friendly correspondence, and I, I did visit her some years later at Dunster House in Harvard. And uh, I spent my undergraduate years uh, where I'd grown up in Austin, Texas, at the University of Texas, pretty much by default. I had started taking math classes there in 10th grade. And uh, by the time I was a freshman, I'd finished uh, the, the math requirements. And actually, the math courses I took in Budapest were surplusage. They counted not even toward elective. And uh, I was too busy to think about uh, applying for colleges during high school, so I, I just stayed at, at, uh, at Texas. And my first act at the, uh, as an official student was to join the staff of the Daily Texan, where I served uh, for a time as associate editor. Um, along with Sam Bakey, I also tried to do my part to fill the void left by George Bergenie's departure from Texas by organizing what I called the Math Olympiad Search for Texas, a, a smaller scale play-by-mail play competition for a promising 
Texas high school students. I ran the operation out of my dorm room. That's my room number. Um, uh, around the same time, Michael Dell, just across the UT campus, was doing something a little more lucrative out of his. Um, I did the uh, grading and wrote the critiques and uh, had the privilege of seeing a few mathematical stars in the making. All that advanced placement also gave me time to get involved in student government, which became inconvenient when I realized that the Budapest program would begin more than two months uh, before the end of my term as student body president at UT. So I ended up becoming the first president to resign since World War II <laughs> and uh, left my office 32, actually 30, 30 years to the day before um, President Obama left his, which I just looked over. January 20th, 1987 is the date there. Um, it created quite a controversy on campus, but on the whole, my former newspaper colleagues treated me kindly. Uh, you can see this uh, student first, politician second. They, they misdescribed uh, BSM as a research project in Budapest, uh, but uh, noted that uh, uh, that shouldn't surprise anyone. Chin has always been a student first, and considering what the student government went through before me, uh, that's probably why uh, they, they voted for me. Um, even as I rode out of town on a rail, <laughs> yeah. Um, I, in those days of film, uh, photos were scarcer, and good photos were scarcer still, and uh, uh, Jonathan Shapiro, uh, who came to the uh, 100 over 3 reunion, um, uh, was uh, uh, gracious enough to, to give me the better photos for this uh, presentation. Um, fifth, very small program, 15 students, eight course offerings. Uh, somehow it all worked, it was all enough. And we were all enough for each other. We, we also had a, a, a vibrant and collaborative uh, community. Um, I remember a lot of trudging around in the cold and the snow and the wind. And I, I, I remember um, Roja, uh, Paul Roja, who fell ill in the middle of the semester and invited us uh, for class at his home. Um, with lunch uh, for a, a lesson on uh, 4A analysis and the well-tempered clavier. Mm -hmm. And I still have his lecture notes on the behavior of tuplets and um, circulant matrices. And I remember Gabor Halas and his uh, inimitable, impeccable chalkboard technique recreated in part here on our spring break homework assignment. Um, I remember uh, my books and papers crammed into every crevice of a dense antique collection in our one room, uh, living room apartment I shared with Mark Introtter from Harvard. And I remember waving goodbye to my friend Navid for the last time the evening before my flight home. Um, I began my graduate studies at Oxford that fall in a Rhodes Scholarship, and I completed my DPhil with a thesis on parallel cal computer algorithms and architectures on this, under the supervision of Dominic Welsh. Um, and Bill McCall. And I remember pump, punting on the ISIS and writing for ISIS magazine, attending and later presenting at conferences throughout the UK and Europe, and lots of very earnest conversations with groups of friends in tiny bedrooms and formal dinner dances. And toward the end of my, my four years there, I, I got to attend what turned out to be a watershed conference in the area of Boolean function co complexity and even got to present a small result there. After Oxford, my first teaching job was as visiting assistant professor of mathematics at Texas A&M University. I started a math contest there uh, for high school students that's now in its 27th year. But uh, I was lonely there, both personally and professionally, and I thought a return to England to reconnect with um, that community would help. So I, I taught computer science uh, for a little while at King's College London. But there I wasn't doing much more in, in research than publishing pieces of my DPhil thesis. And I, I was getting in, interested in the internet and the challenges it was posing for uh, American law and public policy. And I started going to seminars at the London School of e Economics to start learning how to speak that language. Uh, but that just made me homesick and think about returning to study public policy in the US. I didn't think about it much at the time, but uh, at my farewell reception was really my last day as a professional mathematician. 
And I, I applied to the master's program at the LBJ uh, School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas in my hometown of Austin. But uh, instead, I was offered a one-year lectureship there to teach statistics and operations research and to sit in on public policy seminars as I wanted uh, to learn about the, uh, the field. And uh, in, this, in the meantime, I also conceived and mobilized a student movement led by Irwin Tang uh, for the establishment of a center of Asian American studies, the first one in the South. Um, I applied to just one law school, um, Yale. And fortunately, I got in, and uh, I, I spent as little time as possible on campus and as much time as possible uh, trying to write and publish law review articles. And I published five by graduation, including uh, you know, this somewhat prescient empirical study of the World Wide Web's polarizing effect on dem democratic discourse, uh, the date 1996, so early on that you actually had to start with a three-page explanation to the reader of what the web was. <laughs> so, um, I gained a little weight in my three years there. Um, and after a few years in Washington, clerking on the antitrust case of the century and practicing technology law at a big firm, I got to begin my teaching uh, career where I am still now, uh, at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. I've been there uh, for 18 years now. And over those years, I've had a chance to reconnect with my classmate, Joff Joffith Wood, who um, I'm uh, honored to have here now. And uh, I see Francis, who I'm um, also uh, uh, very uh, delighted uh, could, could make it. Um, and I, um, I had the opportunity to attend the J, actually perfect timing to, <laughs> um, uh, to attend the JMM in Seattle uh, three years ago to see uh, Francis uh, present George with the richly deserved honor of the Gillian Who Distinguished Service um, Award for Mathematics. And I was honored out of all the countless students that uh, George mentored, encouraged, and empowered in the art of problem solving. Uh, over uh, many decades uh, to, to get to sign his citation as uh, one of uh, 10 students who uh, felt his influence. Boy, by the way, I'm, I'm there too. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and yeah, Cuban's there too. Right. Sure. Um, and uh, you probably recognize uh, many other names there. Um, uh, and equally honored uh, to have seen Francis as a, uh, earlier in, in our careers as a future star in the making when we had both been math majors at the University of Texas. Uh, I don't know if you, I, I, I didn't identify myself, so maybe uh, uh, you didn't know this, but I, I, I had been hired at, uh, to, as a homework grader for at least two of the courses that, that you took. I was in. Yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> And as busy as I was at the time with student government, I'm, sh I'm pretty sure I'd gotten the bad habit of using your, your papers as answer keys. <laughs> um, um, I, I was surprised to learn through Facebook that the, uh, the admiration was mutual after I posted, posted this picture of my dinner with Lotzi that you've heard about, uh, where he kindly invited me to give this talk. Um, I missed the next JMM, but uh, Francis's legendary farewell address is on YouTube. And uh, how many of you have seen it? OK, pretty much everyone. Yeah. Um, and in watching it, I saw the math teacher and scholar that I had dreamed of becoming in my formative years, but fully realized in the grace, decency, and integrity of spirit that is uniquely Francis's. In his address, Francis makes the case that mathematics is for human flourishing an insight that supplies a compelling rationale for teaching mathematics to all human beings. For mathematics can empower every person to satisfy five basic human desires, play, beauty, truth, justice, and love. I no longer teach mathematics to classrooms of students, but I am still in a position to teach mathematics through the articles that I publish in law journals. And I strive to do so in a way that empowers the public to pursue each of these desires in the respective legal environments while identifying legally significant problems and solving them using mathematical methodologies that tend to be new or at least unusual in legal literature. And so let me offer a few examples. First, play. Consider the Pocellier cell, a rather ingenious kinematic construction that converts rotary motion to straight line motion. Is it a mathematical theorem or the specification of a machine? 
The answer is yes, <laughs> both, right? But patent law demands that we choose one or the other, an unpatentable theorem or a patentable machine. And perhaps we should have second thoughts about characterizing kinematic linkages as machines because they can provide the essential insights for more theorems. The Patent Office has invited public comments on this topic, and I'm planning to submit mine, as I have done from time to time over the years. And here's what I'm planning to say. Patents are for work. Math is for play. Math is not really about causing outcomes, as Francis puts it. In contrast, the Supreme Court has long held that what makes a discovery patentable is the result or effect it can cause when used in practice. But Poselius' theorem doesn't cause the linear motion of the hinge uh, at point E any more than the Pythagoras, if Pythagorean theorem causes me to walk across the diagonal of the intramural soccer field in two minutes. Right? In filing this comment, I will be speaking math to the law for the purpose of preserving the public's right to play free from patent claims. The second human need is beauty. Consider the beauty of the living world and the transcendent beauty of the double helix structure and its genetic function in the appreciative writings of France, uh, uh, Freeman Dyson. Well, the search for clinically significant DNA sequences in the human <coughs> genome has relied in part on gene expression studies in which co-occurring sequences have been identified using single link linkage hierarchical clustering which proceeds to combine objects into clusters in the same manner in which vertices are connected into components by Kruskal's minimum spanning tree algorithm. In 2005, I built on Kruskal's proof to characterize the preclusive effects of patented probes on clustering results. And I had the proof handy because I still had my notebook from Andras Frank's combinatorial algorithms class in Budapest. The preclusive effects of DNA probe patents also led me to combinatorial chemistry as a tool for legal intervention. At the time, the legal, uh, the legal precedent uh, let, left the door open for DNA probe patents because the prior art references teaching general methods of isolating DNA molecules could not be combined for legal purposes with specific sequence listings to invalidate patent claims they were considered two separate documents. So my solution was to put them together in one document. A generic methodological disclosure appended to a listing uh, of 11 million oligonucleotide sequences in one big ASCII file on a CD-ROM, too unwieldy and scientifically trivial to publish in a journal, but just right as prior art to invalidate patents. I put one copy in the UNC library and I sent a few dozen out to patent attorneys just as a proof of concept. I wasn't out to change the world, but I did prove the concept. By the time I wrote in the law review about the project in 2006, the CD-ROM had been cited in 20 patent proceedings and there have now been 65 citations. But in the meantime, the ground has shifted and the Supreme Court has categorically held isolated oligonucleotides to be unpatentable. So at least those DNA sequences that have been excerpted from the book of nature's beauty have now been preserved from the claims of the patent system. The third human need is truth. Since we can't tr count on corporate officers and directors to tell us the truth about whether they were using inside information to time the market when they bought and sold their companies, stock within a six month period, the securities laws actually require them to surrender any profits from that kind of short-term trading back to the company. Uh, that's a strict liability rule. So um, how much profit needs to be surrendered as a maximum calculation from a lengthy sequence of purchases and sales? Well, in a 1943 opinion, Second Circuit judge and former Yale Law School Dean Charles Clark opined that the company should get the maximum possible profit and that this maximum can be calculated with the greedy algorithm of iteratively, ma iteratively matching the lowest priced outstanding purchases with the highest priced outstanding sales. When I read the Smolo case in law school, I thought to myself, that can't be right. This is a transportation problem which you can solve with the simplex algorithm. But the greedy algorithm's worth case error is 50%, which I could prove by associating the trading pattern with a bipartite graph and characterizing the ma maximum weight matching. 
um, with the help of the notes that I still had from Andras Frank's class on that subject. <laughs> now, Judge Clark can't be uh, blamed for failing to use the simplex algorithm four years before it was invented, right? But uh, he would have been better off following the approach that Judge Learned Hand took. Uh, Hand was one of the most distinguished and prolific uh, judges in our nation's history. And he simply gave the plaintiff, Stella Gratz, the entitlement to match purchases and sales as she saw fit. Uh, so Judge Hand designed a mechanism that got the court out of the business of designing algorithms. Similarly, the wise jurisprudential approach is to order parties to cut and choose rather than to try to solve the subset sum problem from the bench. But for uh, more than 60 years, the Gratz case has been un universally misread as endorsing the greedy algorithm of Smolo. No one's caught this because even though the Smolo algorithm's worst case error is 50%, its actual error in most cases is zero. Uh, so using the loop invariant form of correctness proofs, I was able to show that the Smolo algorithm is correct whenever all the defendant's traits have occurred within a single six month period, which is usually the case in these cases. So this leads to a very different reading of Judge Hand's most important insider trading decision that still appears in case books, as well as stronger deterrence against insider trading, moving our securities markets a little bit closer to the truth. The fourth human need is justice. 15 years after Justice Kennedy's pivotal concurrence in Vieth, voting rights activists are working to apply new technologies to the problem of partisan gerrymandering. In the recent Wisconsin case, I filed a Supreme Court brief asking the court to defer to the trial court's weighing of scientific evidence where Democratic voters had been on the wrong end of a historically large efficiency gap in the conversion of statewide votes to seats in the state legislature. Even so, there, there remains a problem with the efficiency gap in that it is based on an ideal linear step functional relationship between statewide votes and seats that is uniformed uh, across all states and elections and therefore does not account for the specific political geography of the state in question. We're taking a different approach in challenging North Carolina's 2016 congressional redistricting in which Democratic voters have been disproportionately packed into districts 1, 4, and 12. A team in the math department at Duke, led by Jonathan Mattingly, used a Markov chain Monte Carlo sampling to generate a large ensemble of legally compliant maps by taking a random walk through the space of all possible compliant maps. They were then able to show that the legislature enacted a map that was an outlier in districts 1, 4, and 12 in terms of having extremely high percentages of Democratic vote shares in 2016. While the decision goes on appeal to the Supreme Court this spring, we're publishing a law review article together and um, filing another brief in the hope that these new mathematical methods will finally be able to point the way to justice. The fifth and last human need is love. As social networking has become a meaningful constituent of even our most intimate relationships, privacy concerns have also become increasingly salient. One mechanism that can provide quantifiable upper bounds on the disclosure of identifying information called differential privacy is the addition of random noise from the Laplace distribution. And playing around with Facebook's advertising interface, I observed that Facebook's estimates of the size of target audiences weren't adding up. So if you were looking, for example, at a privacy sensitive uh, population like people aged 50 to 51 who were interested in Alzheimer's disease in North Carolina, you'd get a total of 660 if you combine the results of separate queries for the 50 and 51 year olds and only 60, 620 if you queried for the range of 50 to 51 year olds. Too large a discrepancy uh, to be explained solely by any discipline for rounding to a multiple of 20. Moreover, these discrepancies were persistent on repeated queries. So my null hypothesis was that Facebook is using a differential privacy mechanism that is adding Laplace noise rounding to the nearest multiple or uh, a multiple of 20 using some specified discipline 
and caching the results so that the mechanism couldn't be defeated, say, by repeating the query a large number of times and averaging out the noise. So using generating functions to construct the test statistic, I was able to show that the behavior of Facebook advertising it in interface was not inconsistent with this hypothesis. So Facebook may be trying to protect the privacy of you and your loved ones, at least in this context, even though they've subsequently uh, failed in, in many others. I'm fortunate to have had these opportunities to apply what I had as the privilege of learning from some of the greatest math, math professors and mathematicians of our generation to offer solutions to legal problems that go some way toward advancing the human values of play, beauty, truth, justice, and love. Now adding to what is already being recognized as a generationally defining manifesto for the, the mathematics profession has felt a bit like gilding the lily, but I did want to take up Lotzi's kind invitation to add my perspective to this week's proceedings at the JAMM, and to, if I may, to leave you with the following charge. Use your position and your voice, the distinctive voice of a mathematician, to speak truth to power. Remember that the plaintiff's case in Brown versus Board of Education was based on statistical evidence. Use your voice boldly, risking whatever is necessary for your truth to be heard. I can't claim to have risked very much, but I have paid a price. Mathematical results published in law journals are never going to attract a large audience. Mm -hmm. But I have found great personal and professional satisfaction in the diversity and sophistication of the mathematical techniques I have been able to bring into the legal conversation. Some of them for the first time, while achieving a number of results that benefit the public interest. And so in using my unique position to speak math to the law, I have amplified my voice with the special kind of alchemy that the law performs on the speech acts that come within its precincts, where words are reified into corporations and bureaucracies, freedoms and regulations, civil li liabilities and criminal sanctions, property rights and human rights. In recent years, I've been gratified and humbled to have had the opportunity to return full circle in collaboration with Moon Duchen, who uses her position and her voice tirelessly, the distinctive voice of a great mathematician and a great leader to speak truth to power, risking whatever is necessary for her truth to be heard. She is another of my inspirations, as is Lotsi, uh, uh, Lotsi uh, Bachi, who, uh, uh, from whom I had the honor to learn firsthand of the quasi-polynomial time complexity of the graph isomorphism problem. Uh, a problem that had been of special interest to me in Budapest 32 years ago. Thank you for what you started, and thank you all for the many ways in which the uh, Budapest Semesters in Mathematics program has influenced me and countless other alumni who could have shared their equally rich and multifaceted stories with you today. My journey continues, and I, I'd love to stay in touch with all of you. There's more to explore on my website at andrewchin.com. You're welcome to friend me on Facebook. <laughs> And uh, use your voice boldly now or in the future for any questions or comments you might have. Thank you.